Hi, everybody. It's Jason, and unfortunately, we didn't get a meet on Friday the 13th to continue our work on the websites, but we wanted to continue to move that process along with the slides we had prepared to kick off the day. So in the next little bit in this video, I'm going to walk you through those slides, which cover modern web design. One of the things we know at this point, over 20 years into the web, is that web design will continue to change and evolve. Some of web design, like any design, is function, and what's functional today will evolve based on both the devices we use and the backend coding technologies, as well as server technologies and available bandwidth. Additionally, web design has a style component, and of course we know that style changes over time. So what we wanna do is look at what's both functional and stylish today, and together those things make up the best web design of 2016. Thanks for watching. So at this point, one of the things that we want to look at is what web design looks like in the 21st century. And there's certainly a mix of both functionality and style, as I've already mentioned. To do that best, we're going to go back in time first. So among our group of those of us that are involved in maintaining our websites, some of us never really received formal training on website design. Some of us did, and uh, some of us uh, that did receive that training only received it a long time ago. So we're going to walk through how the web has changed. We, we don't often get the chance to do this. So starting back in 1999, of course, many of us in this group have experience with the web going back prior to that. Um, but in 1999, this is what the initial Google site, actually, this is, I think, the second version of the Google site uh, looked like. And you can see some of the elements are, of course, still there, the multicolored um, Google right in the middle of the screen with the single search bar and then the Google search button. And we all remember the I'm feeling lucky button. And then there are all the links um, that we would not see uh, in the same way in the multicolored boxes on the Google website today. Yahoo looked like this in 1999, and at this point, Yahoo was transitioning uh, to a search engine. Prior to this, Yahoo had been trying to actually compile the internet to become the index of the internet. And of course, as web page creation uh, became faster and more overpowering, that was impossible to do. This is what the Apple uh, website looked like in 1999. Uh, we can see those multicolored iMacs, uh, Power Macs, and iBooks there, as well as the OS 9. So this was pre-OS 10. Uh, and many of us, of course, remember using OS 5 and 6 and 7. Um, and then there was 8 and 9. 9 wasn't around very long. But there you see the Apple Store. Um, and you'll notice in the lower right corner, uh, just the left of the apple it says where to buy because of course you you weren't shopping online then like we're all accustomed to doing today notice also that there is the site map at the bottom of the site and the index um, those were to help you navigate but really cool feature here on the apple site at that time they already had a search bar to do with insight search fast forwarding to 2005 and the Google site uh, continues to have the single search bar in the Google search, I'm feeling lucky. Google has dropped the Yahoo-like exclamation point, um, and yet there are still those links there. They've also gone to a solid white page, and uh, at the bottom of the page, they're telling us that they're searching over 8 billion web pages, which sounds like a lot then. Um, it sounds like a lot now, but of course, we know that the number of web pages that are out there continues to increase over and over and over again. Yahoo in 2005, uh, by this point, Yahoo was already moving into the position that it's held for a number of years as kind of an entry portal. My parents love that. And so there it is, organizing the internet, a very AOL type style with a very busy web page. Um, the logo top center, but lots of links all over that page. And then here is the Apple web page in 2005. Um, they moved to that tab design with sublinks below each tab. Um, there's a dominant image, which was really kind of ahead of its time. 
and then some linked images below that, as well as the hot news headlines, which would pop in and out. Um, on the tab images, you'll know that there is now e-commerce with the store uh, tab up there. Advancing further, but not quite to the present, 2013. Now, I thought this was a really interesting one because the black bar at the top of the Google uh, pages, and for those of us that, whether we use Chrome, uh, Google personally or those of us using it here, we know that that top black bar was around just a few years ago as we moved to Google Apps. And that was a defining feature of using Google, and it's gone as Google moved towards material design and then into material design. And it looks to me, when I, when I went back and found this screenshot, I was like, whoa, old school. Um, now, of course, we've come to recognize the Google uh, doodles and we've still got the advanced search and language tools off to the right there that we saw in the 2005 slide. And of course, the, the dominant feature is the single text box, the Google search and I'm feeling lucky, and the Google web page remaining mostly white, but still having that black menu bar at the top of the page. The Apple website, the tabs have morphed into a single row um, that is defined by really individual buttons. Um, much less busy, much cleaner by 2013, but the design was really very similar to 2005. That row at the top, followed by a single dominant image, and then four um, other image buttons below that, smaller links further below that. So a lot of similarities between um, 2005 and 2013, but 2013 a lot cleaner, a lot whiter, a lot less busy. Here we have Google today, uh, no black bar, it's all white, there's only the subtle gray bar at the bottom, even the buttons are less button-like. We can see the advanced tools and the language, um, language tools have disappeared um, from the uh, right side of the search bar and uh, of course, we're all familiar with this year's logo change, which took some people a while to get used to. I suppose there's some people getting used to it. And that's one of the big things that we'll see with our site too, is as it goes through a change, part of the process is just people getting used to um, new navigation and new look and feel, even if it's infinitely better, and even if it's not infinitely better, there's that change process required either way. Yahoo Today, uh, Yahoo also went through their logo design um, a year ago, and uh, we can see that the search bar is still at the top, but this site is still dominated uh, by links going all the way down the left side, very busy with the uh, sub uh, news story items under the main news story, and um, the big ad on the right side, as well as the ads on the lower left side. So Yahoo's site still very busy and yet much cleaner than it was before. You'll notice again, predominantly white space on that side. And then here, Apple's site has continued to evolve, but yet the main features are really exactly the same as they were 10 years ago. Um, the bar at the top has a certain, still dark, but it's got a certain degree of translucence and it extends all the way across the screen. We can see through it. Um, as you see the slide behind Tim Cook, uh, in the background of the bar from TV on over to the right. Uh, then again, we have the single dominant image. That image does flip through and each image has a link on it for video. We'll come back to that in a few minutes. And then below it, Apple retains that same concept of four major uh, image-based buttons to dive in deeper. So what are the elements of today's web? We're gonna go through a bunch of key ones. The first is this flat design. So we've eliminated the drop shadows and gradients that we used to see, and a color is just there as a color. Sometimes you'll see a couple shades of that color. You can see that um, in the Guardian header. The top blue is all one color, and then the bottom blue, there's two different shades of color, uh, one over here and over here, and then the slightly darker shade here. And both of those shades are darker and a little bit different than the, the top shade. And so it is very flat. And while there are multiple colors used, none of them have uh, drop shadows or gradients or anything that make them have the appearance of being 3D. So no 3D, we're just into it being a flat design now. 
heavy use of photography. And as we've pointed out, we've seen this, for example, on the Apple website for a long time, but websites all over the place now are using uh, photography in um, much different and more profound ways. And uh, we, you even would see this in your own Facebook feeds, for example. If you use an image um, in Facebook or in Google Plus or e even in Twitter, though it's more pronounced in Facebook and Google Plus uh, because of both how the pages render and the fact it's long form, you're a lot more likely to get clicks or likes or comments or plus ones on Google Plus um, than you are without an image. It makes it more magazine style. Videos all over the web. Uh, YouTube is obviously one of the most important websites that there is and then YouTube itself feeds lots of other websites with embedded video. So as I mentioned before, each of the major photographic elements of the Apple web page, rather than loading a video, thankfully Apple, Apple doesn't do that. They use very stylish design that also is very functional and that's not trying to force that video to load on loading the web page. But there, there are links on uh, typically now on these that say watch the film and the video is right there. You're one click away from the video on the Apple website as it scrolls through the Apple TV, the September Keynote, the iPad Pro, or whatever Apple is displaying on the front of their website at that time. A card style design is, is very much in favor. And certainly we've heard uh, loudly and clearly from our information literacy coaches and our literacy and media teachers that there's room for card style design on our research resources pages to offer up links uh, to our students for those main research links and databases that we purchase. And um, so this card style design was popularized by both Pinterest and, and really by Microsoft with the Windows 8 uh, Metro or Modern interface. Um, that's, it's kind of been discarded there, but what has been left behind from that is the card style design. And the cards actually originally or originated, uh, pardon me there, uh, with Palm and Palm built it into um, their operating system on their last set of smartphones. And while, while Palm nor those phones survived, um, the card design did. Google also is a big user of the card design. Um, it's evident throughout material design. It's most evident in Google now. Uh, so card design is, a, is an element that makes its way into websites as well. Space and spacing. So where we used to have tight lettering and the precision of clicking with a mouse, today in a touchscreen world, whether it's on um, the many laptops, including our own, that have touchscreens or on mobile devices, um, our fingers are fatter and less precise than is a stylus or, or a mouse click. And so spacing is really important. And PowerSchool made this change a couple of years ago, but underneath the search power in PowerSchool admin, the letter row and the grade level row below that, which also has the genders included, those are way more spaced out than they used to be. Uh, even the menu on the left side, there's much more spacing between the rows and a bigger font than there was previously. So those are the kinds of changes um, that are really different from what websites were like. And our templates are built around those same space and spacing elements, and we want to maintain those. Certainly those of us on touch screens will use them. Um, and as early as next year, we'll have more and more of our students on touch screens. We'd love to be buying touch screen devices, frankly, for our third through eighth graders. But with the display breakage rate um, in our middle schools, we frankly can't afford replacement screens. Um, will we have them at some point? Yeah, I imagine we would as costs come down and durability goes up. So I think it's just a matter of time before we're all using touch screens, not to do all of our work, um, and sometimes the precision of the mouse is much better, but to do some of our work. Making a website that's mobile responsive is critical. One of the things we're going to look at on Wednesday is uh, websites, uh, school district websites in our area that aren't mobile responsive. Um, I myself had a frustrating experience with this today. So this is really, really important. So here you can see a website that as you go from the card on the left, there's a hamburger button on that card. And when you click on the hamburger button, it looks very much like ours. This is twit.tv, one of the major, major podcast networks. Um, and the menu pops out there uh, from the right side of the screen. And then the card all the way on the right is if you scroll further down, that renders much differently on a computer uh, 
uh, or a tablet than it would on a phone. And it's going to adjust based on screen size. Now, mobile responsive design isn't just for parent communication, of course. As we look at our students using different devices moving forward, we need to consider mobile responsive design for parents, for staff members on their personal devices, as well as uh, for our students as well. So good design is always about balance. And we have to balance a variety of things and there's not always a single right or wrong choice, um, but that balance is a really important thing to be very conscious of and to be talking about as we're making design decisions and saying we're trying to balance X with Y and the more we do of Y, the worse it is for X, but maybe we'll make that decision because of these factors or vice versa. Likewise, good design is not only usable, but it's beautiful as well. And it brings the user in and we want to engage with the good design in those cases. Our goal here is again, not just for parent communication, but also for our student use to have that design be both usable and beautiful. At the same time, like the way most of us get our information, rarely today do most people go to the homepage of the New York Times or the Chicago Tribune or the Daily Herald or Engadget or The Verge or CNN or some sports website to get their news. Rather, they're clicking to deep links directly from places like Facebook and Twitter and Pinterest and uh, uh, a text message or a hangout or an email and going straight to that deep linked article or piece of information that they're looking for. Um, they also get those deep links directly from Google search. And of course, increasingly, our kids are getting deep links directly from us to pages in our websites or sharing them with each other. Um, Nevertheless, we want our website to be not only usable, but beautiful because beauty makes them more usable. Finally, we have to remember, we're not designing for the web of the past that we looked at. We're not even designing for the web of today, but rather we're designing for the future. This design will probably last us some number of years, maybe five years. I'm not exactly sure, but it will last us much less long than our last design did as we keep up with both the functional changes of the web uh, as well as the fashion changes of the web. So thanks very much for watching this. We look forward to engaging in some activities to look at where we can uh, not improve the fundamental designs of our website because we're, we're moving forward at this point, but make sure that we're using our templates to the best degree possible and that we're, we're considering all of these 2016 design options as we port our content over and add new content. Thanks again.